what most investors need to focus on is finding quality over quantity. And when we looked at all of these scenarios, backed it off a little bit to be more consistent with where the variables should lie, it was very clear that the optimal allocation was between when you introduce the 11th and 12th and 20th position into your portfolio, you're not necessarily getting the diversification benefits. So you can have a portfolio across sectors and geographies and market caps. And when there's a crisis, they all seem to move in unison. But for folks that aren't accredited and can't come up with that sort of capital, what do they do? And I say, just take 100% of your portfolio, split it in half and buy the and when you check in on your portfolio over the next two or three years, you'll find you're doing very well. So I just want to do a formal introduction to these amazing gentlemen. I first met him back in two years ago when I flew to Omaha to attend Warren Buffett's uh, shareholder meeting. And he was so generous. He was so kind. He was actually holding a barbecue party for all the investors over there, right? So that's how I went to his Sparky Wheel Card Party and had so much fun. I get to network and learn from so many investors all over the world. And of course, learn from him as well, right? So who is this person? His name is Matthew Peterson. And he's a managing partner of Peterson Capital Management, a firm that he founded in 2011. So with more than like 13 years of experience as a portfolio manager, he has really delivered a world-class track record for his partner. A lot of times it's a delivering a double digit return for his investors, for his partners. And he always combine his investing approach with something that is innovative, but at the same time, very, very disciplined. And without further ado, let's welcome Matthew to be here. Thank you, Chloe. It is a real honor and pleasure to be here. It's so nice to see you again. And of yes. course, we just last month hosted our annual meeting and you were such a wonderful host. So we have all of those videos going online and it's a real pleasure to be here with all of your followers. I just want to ask you from a very personal level, right? Right now, you are a very successful investor. You manage funds for your clients, but I imagine the journey it's not difficult. Uh, it's not easy, right? Like you definitely go through a lot of difficulties to get to where you are today. So I'm very curious, like, can you share with us a little bit more about how you get started in investing? Thanks for the great question. Again, it's great to be here. I think it's very important people focus on the long term. There's so much noise in the markets. And when it comes to investing and even when it comes to life, there's a lot of short-term noise that will distract you from the long-term objectives and goals. So that's always been very ingrained in me. I was always thinking very strategically about the long term. Uh, I'm in my mid 40s now. I'm 44. And back when I was even a child, I was trying to compound capital by going to different banks and trying to get higher interest rates. So this is very much ingrained in me, uh, as it probably is for many of your followers. And over uh, the years, I recognized that what the focus is, is really on long-term value creation. And uh, there's a enormous aspect that comes from having an entrepreneurial mindset. So when I was young, I was always starting businesses. I was always trying to uh, focus on compounding capital. And by the time I went to university, I was really uh, determined to run my own fund. So I studied economics and math, and then I went out. After uh, living in Beijing for uh, a while, Ooh. I went out to New York and I worked on Wall Street and I spent about seven years doing risk management, primarily with Goldman Sachs. Uh, and for two of those years, I was in London. I was in London for the financial crisis in 2009. And uh, through that period, I was still maintaining my focus. I was planning to run the own, my own fund and I was uh, earning my CFA designations and really putting the building blocks in place. And the beauty about this industry is that if you really specialize and become an expert in the financial markets, it's very scalable. So uh, in 2011, as you mentioned, we launched our own fund uh, and we started from very humble beginnings. I launched with 100,000 of my own capital and 25,000 from a friend. So basically no money. And over 13 years, we've climbed now to 27 million which is still a very modest size fund. We're not filing 13 Fs, uh, but we'll reach 100 million over the next few years. And uh, 
And we just keep putting one foot ahead of the next. So we're really focused on long-term. We're really focused on value creation. And because our expertise is so scalable, we can now deliver this value for others. And I believe when it comes to managing people's fund, there's definitely a lot of stress that you yourself uh, will go through. How do you cope with that stress? How do you make sure that you deliver, you know, like stunning performance for your clients, which you have been doing that for the past decade, like double digit return? How do you do that? There's a few things that I think are very essential. So one thing that we do internally with our firm is it's very important that we align all of our interests with the LP, with our partners' interests. Okay, we now have capital from, excuse me, from about 70 plus families. And because we've structured this well, and because of my assets are also all in the fund. And so every operational decision and every investment decision is automatically aligned. Uh, it basically means that we can focus on making the absolute best decision for the portfolio. And we know that's going to translate to everybody else. So one thing we try to do is we're constantly innovating and even using technology to try to remove emotion and cognitive biases out of our process. So if we have a long-term uh, strategy that will outperform, we just need to maintain our discipline through the bumpy periods. And certainly uh, I am human. We are all human. We all have the same emotions. And that's what I think many people fail to recognize. Just because you're a portfolio manager doesn't mean that you're excluded from the same uh, cognitive biases and other uh, ancillary sort of threats to maintaining the, the portfolio. So uh, we have to work very hard to overcome those biases. We have to study psychology. We have to learn how the herd mentality would affect things. We have to understand uh, how we can uh, position ourselves so that we're not driven by things like social proof. Uh, if the whole market goes one direction, we would, don't wanna be uh, just simply followers. And um, and it's a very contagious thing. So we have to be very aware and uh, really implement things objectively. And that is, uh, that's the main uh, approach. But on top of that, Chloe, I'll add, we have all sorts of checklists. And we use these checklists uh, at different times throughout our process. So we have an investment checklist that we would go through before we make a large investment. But we also have a crisis management checklist. And these are very specific items. It's like when, uh, and that's a lot of times there's other investors uh, that you've interviewed uh, who talk about their checklists. And a lot of times they don't want to tell you exactly what's on the checklist because they are very personal. It is like uh, maintaining uh, standard exercise, eating routines, uh, even taking, uh, you know, a, a recess from watching the portfolio because you don't want to be, uh, acting in the portfolio when your mind is, uh, when your mind is distracted. And so some of these checklists, like a crisis management checklist comes really into play when we have a position that might be moving against what we previously thought. So on the checklist, it says to uh, make sure and go and revalue the position that we're concerned about because uh, sometimes by revaluing it, you realize the thesis is right, the analysis is right, the data is correct, and there's actually nothing to worry about. So we constantly have to navigate these challenging periods. There's a, you know, uh, uh, it's a stormy world out there. So. Things in the short term can be irrational and volatile, and you really need to focus on the long term and avoid the noise. And these checklists help us maintain that discipline. I absolutely love what you are sharing. I think I'm picking up a lot of golden insights from this. Firstly, like even, you know, like a lot of times we as individual investors, retail investors, we go through a lot of emotions and uh, we tend to think that, oh, portfolio managers, you guys are immune to it. But actually we are all human beings, right? And everybody mm -hmm. will go through certain kind of emotions and it's very normal. So if you are listening right now, okay, if you go through emotions, how many of you been through emotions before in your investing journey. If that is you, can you type 
it's okay. <laughs> Put it in the chat. <laughs> it's okay. It's totally normal. Don't need to beat yourself down because it's just part and parcel of your learning journey that you will go through emotions. But most importantly is like what Matthew said, it's a constant learning process, right? You want to make sure you have certain checklists that hold your emotions under control. You want to make sure you reevaluate the decision, right? Because when it comes to investing, it's not like, oh, you buy and you forget. <laughs> it's more like a constant journey to keep up with the companies, reevaluating it, whether is it still a good company, whether should you actually be buying more right now if the prices is dropping. So, um, that's why it's a lot of work. And that's why I always respect professional fund managers like you guys, because you really put in a lot of effort to not just manage your own fund, right? You have the, the scheme, the game, right? But right now you're also managing your client's fund. So uh, I think our audience here are also getting very curious. Like if you don't mind sharing, what are you holding in your own portfolio? And I understand that for your funds, you are relatively concentrated. How do you ensure that it's the right mix of concentration without taking too much risk? Yes, this is a really important question and concept. Uh, if we want to start from the very beginning, I would say that what most investors need to focus on is finding quality over quantity. We are always focused on value investing principles. So we're looking to acquire assets for less than they're worth. And that's fundamentally what all of the value investing funds are looking to do. They're looking to sort of project out all of the future cash flows for the next many years, and then find an appropriate discount rate and bring all those cash flows back to the current present day. And that should be the intrinsic value of the business. And so what we're looking to do is really acquire a super high quality business with a great business model with incredible management, particularly with exceptional asset or capital allocation capability. And then on top of that, we're looking to buy it at a very, very reasonable or cheap price. And then we're focused on holding on to that for the long term. And what happens as you go through this process is you start to recognize there are not very many opportunities of this nature. If you find an extraordinary business model with an extraordinary management team, the price is usually extremely high. There's a lot of demand for that stock and it's very hard to get in at a very low price. So you have to be very patient and ultimately what this leads to is a highly concentrated portfolio. And other than a few investors like Peter Lynch, who was somewhat success, who was extremely successful with a larger basket of securities, the majority of outperforming funds are very concentrated in nature. And you can imagine that the most successful, the people that have truly built uh, you know, billion dollar portfolios and entrepreneurs who have started businesses, they're usually getting wealthy off one or two companies that they've held on to for many, many decades. And so we are replicating that approach. And this is proven actually uh, academically, mathematically. Uh, I was speaking at a conference uh, a few years ago, uh, Guy Spears Conference out in Switzerland. And I decided to invert the Kelly criterion because the Kelly criterion uh, is basically a, a, a mathematical concept that really deliberately and directly shows that concentration outperforms. And as you increase the amount of positions, you're not always reducing your risk. So people oftentimes mistake volatility for real risk, which is the risk of a permanent loss in capital. And so by simply focusing on a bottom-up analysis, by looking at company-specific uh, details and fundamentals, you position yourself to own a piece of the business and then ride with the growth of that business over the long term. And that's truly the way to do things. So uh, if you, what I did in Excel a bunch of years ago uh, is I inverted the Kelly criterion. I said, look, uh, the Kelly criterion, for your audience says, 
if you know the probability of something working and you know the outcome, if it works, and you know the probability of something not working or being incorrect, and you know the outcome if you're incorrect, and you have a fixed pool of capital, uh, which you would have in your own portfolio or as a portfolio that you're managing for others, there is an objective allocation of capital to maximize the growth. The challenge is that some of the factors going into the model are subjective. So how do you know the probability of success before the future unfolds? And how do you know what happens when you are right? You could be right and the market is irrational and somehow the price is going down. So uh, you need to evaluate all these components. And in order to do so, I just inverted it. I said, let's evaluate every scenario. Let's look at what would happen if you are always right or never right. What would happen if when you're right, you're making 100x or when you're right, you're losing 100%. And when we looked at all of these scenarios and then backed it off a little bit to be more consistent with where the variables should lie, it was very clear that the optimal allocation was between three and 10 positions. And to go beyond those positions is actually less risk reduction than many people expect. So diversification is really, it's a powerful tool if you're fearful. It's a powerful tool because it will make your portfolio potentially more stable, but it is very difficult to outperform. When you introduce the 11th and 12th and 20th position into your portfolio, you're not necessarily getting the diversification benefits because in a crisis, correlation often goes to one between even seemingly diverse holdings. So you can have a portfolio across sectors and geographies and market caps. And when there's a crisis, they all seem to move in unison. Hmm. And so uh, you don't always achieve the risk reduction just by introducing new portfolio positions. But what you do do if you're doing really in-depth research, fundamental research and looking at what is the real IRR potential of this position, your 11th and 12th and 20th investment should objectively have a lower expected return than your first investment. So if you're not getting any diversification benefits from number 20, but you're introducing a lower expected return, you are now no more diversified and you have lower respected returns. And that is fundamentally why a diversified portfolio has a less probable uh, expectation of outperforming. You must be concentrated if you really want to outperform. Uh, otherwise, you will struggle to even get general market performance. And so we have to have a lot of conviction. And what that means is we have discipline in our process, in our uh, analysis, and we understand the fundamentals of the businesses so well. Uh, and we can sit around with seven in our portfolio and it's actually not concerning. I sleep very well at night because the positions we own are so wonderful, so high quality. They're run by terrific management teams. These management teams, can navigate for us the unexpected situations of the future. So we don't have to panic if something unexpected occurs. We know the management team is capable of allocating capital correctly, and we can actually, in some capacity, learn from them. We can watch what they're doing in times of crisis, and we can evaluate the scenario, and we can say, well, that's a very interesting approach, and maybe this will work, and maybe it won't work. But generally, with this high-quality management team, and a great business model and really low prices, we've positioned ourselves very strongly for high expected future returns. And because we're concentrated, we just watch our seven holdings. And for many years, in fact, this entire year, we haven't sold a holding. And in fact, last year, we only sold one position. So we are uh, very long-term. We hold these concentrated portfolios. We do deep fundamental analysis and this helps uh, with the conviction, expected returns, and I strong. I think it's misunderstood by the general community. Massive diversification will not lead to outperformance. It might lead to reduced short-term volatility, but it doesn't actually help your portfolio. It might. It might help diversify. Warren Buffett says this, and I. I think it's 
mostly correct. Uh, it's a little harsh, but he says diversification is for people who don't know what they're doing. And I think that's that's correct. Beautiful. And I'm learning a lot from this conversation. How many of you are learning and picking up a lot of uh, things that you can do to improve your portfolio? If that is you, can type learn in the chat, right? And Matthew, he also reviewed what is actually an optimal uh, portfolio allocations that you be you should be looking at, especially if you are picking up individual stocks, like what Matthew he himself is doing, right? You should be... Guys, can you put it in the chat? What is the numbers that you should be looking at if you are picking individual stocks? Maximum, how many? Between what to what? Anybody pick up the number just now? Because I clearly wrote it down. Yes, exactly. It's three to 10, all right? Because anything more than that, uh, research has shown that it doesn't mean that you are reducing your risk, right? And at the same time, it becomes harder and harder to outperform the market, right? Which in this case is the US broad index, S&P 500. So if you cannot outperform the market, <laughs> a lot of times it's better to just buy the market, right? To invest in okay. S&P 500, right? But, yeah, but if you can do that because you really stick to the principles of buying high quality company and very importantly, buy at the right price, at a good price and hold them for the long term, that's how you are able to outperform the market, which a lot of fund managers are trying to do as well, right? So, I understand. Chloe, that. maybe I'll interrupt you for a minute sure. and uh, elaborate for a second because I see all sure. these three to tens and I want to be very clear. So uh, the Kelly criterion doesn't uh, consider volatility and volatility is a is a really difficult. Uh, it, it can put a lot of negative pressure on people's psychology. So uh, you, you may have learned from Daniel Kahneman and others in like thinking fast and slow that uh, the pain of a loss is about twice as great. It, it's felt about twice as hard as, as the pleasure of a game. And so if you go through uh, the entire year watching your portfolio carefully, and you're seeing 1% down and then 1% up and then 1% down and 1.1% up, and at the end of the year, you have a 10% gain, you might be miserable. And so that is a very difficult position for many people to be in. It's a very personal choice. So three to 10 does not account for volatility. What it does is it avoids a total loss. And so what many people do is they try to do twice the Kelly optimal. So it is reasonable for people to have six to 20 to avoid this cognitive dissonance that they're going to feel when they've made a good selection. I mean, a good position is going to be fluctuating maybe 20, 30, 40% every year from peak to trough. That's a painful situation to be in if this is your retirement savings. Additionally, so it's okay to have slightly more, but you don't want to be investing in your 21st, 25th. That's way too many. And that is how most mutual funds operate. And that's how most wealth managers will operate. And the reason is they want their clients to have cognitive comfort. They're not necessarily maximizing their wealth, expected growth in their wealth, the compounded growth. They're instead making sure that everybody is comfortable. And so you introduce these further positions, but it's very difficult to outperform. And so uh, you can have more than three. I wouldn't have more than 20. Uh, and if you do a fundamental bottom-up analysis, you can take this approach. But as you correctly stated, you can just buy the market. Mm -hmm. You can outperform everyone. In fact, uh, we get a lot of requests from people to help who maybe can't afford to be in the fund. We like to help uh, people. It's very rewarding. I love to see people grow their wealth. And when you have a, let's say you have a million dollar portfolio. If you think along these lines, what you need to do is you need to do your research until you are until you have the conviction to allocate 100,000 to that position. Otherwise, you're not making a, a meaningful investment. In fact, if you have a million dollar portfolio, maybe you would start by making a 200,000 investment. And these are large convictions. So it should 
it, these are large allocations, so it should force you to make sure that you've done your homework, mm -hmm. to make sure that you're allocating, because you wouldn't allocate 20% of your entire net worth to something unless you were sure. And you're not going to be sure what happens over the next year. It's almost impossible to tell what's going to happen over the next 12 months. But you can be very certain about what will happen over the next five years. You can see trends in the marketplace. You can see demands for goods and products. You can see earnings increasing. You can see margins that are strong. You can see a great business model, great management teams, and a low value. And you can become very confident. And that's when you can go ahead and put 20% of your net worth into a single possible opportunity. And it's that level of conviction that will allow you to really grow your net worth over uh, over five to 10 years. I really like what you talk about in terms of the long-term mindset, right? Like you can see that Matthew, he is not looking at this company, how it's going to perform in the next year, right? In the next two years, but he's looking at like a minimum five years kind of horizon. And because of that, right, he's able to, in order to invest for five years, right, the kind of longer period of time, he also need to make sure that he really does his homework right, so that he has a conviction. And I think a lot of times, uh, one thing that I personally learned from my own past experience is that in the past, I was so greedy. I was trying to buy every single thing that I thought that was pretty good. But then uh, just like what you said, my conviction was so low that every single position was just a tiny, like a, like a few thousand dollars. And even though they gone up, for like 100%, it's not going to make any real difference to my life, right? That's when I also realized that in order to really have that conviction to buy huge, to buy big, you really want to make sure you study hard, right? And if you don't want to study hard in terms of individual stocks, then it's probably better to just invest in ETF, in an index that you don't need to think too much, but then in the long run, it's still going to compound for you. That's right. In fact, um, to add to that point, Chloe, when even family members, family members, friends come to me looking for investment ideas, it's very difficult to give them an idea because they don't have any conviction. They don't have any background. So if I were to tell somebody to go and buy a specific stock and that stock were to fall by 10%, it's very common that they would panic because they don't know what's going on and then they would sell and they would lose money. And so I've found a really... Uh, simple standard approach and it tends it's done extremely well for everybody I've spoken to about this they come to me and they instead of we have a two million dollar minimum for our main class we have an exception class but for folks that aren't accredited and can't come up with that sort of capital what do they do and I say just take a hundred percent of your portfolio split it in half and buy the S&P 500 and buy Berkshire Hathaway and go and specialize on whatever you want to do, go on vacation, do something else. And when you check in on your portfolio over the next two or three years, you'll find you're doing very well. And I think that is a really comfortable way for someone who doesn't want to be, you know, tearing through financial statements all day long. You know, people that retire and then go into their, suddenly they want to become their own portfolio managers. I think you should enjoy your retirement and you should just, let Warren Buffett invest for you, invest in the S&P 513F and go and enjoy yourself. And you will probably do better and it will require no time. And so these are real. You will be much happier. And you will be far happier. Yes, you will be far happier. So this whole uh, massive diversification requirement is false. It's like if you just buy the S&P 500 with literally half of your money, and you buy like Berkshire Hathaway with the other half of your money, I don't think you need to do anything else. I love that. I love that. And I think there are some questions coming in from the chat. We will go to those questions very, uh, very soon after I go through the rest of the questions. Uh, I'm also very curious about your thoughts on China, right? Because recently China picked up so much uh, what's your take on that? Like, because I know one of your position, it's also in a Chinese company. Um, do you still think that this is the right time to invest in China? Yes, this is a really controversial question, I think, because people all over the world have very different opinions. But the facts are that the long-term growth potential remains strong. China is going to do very well. The middle class is going to grow. I don't think that 
the next 20 years of growth in China cannot is unlikely to be uh, as high as the last 20 years. But there are outstanding businesses in China. You can get so much value in the Chinese market. So I do think that the the long, if you focus on the long term, there are huge opportunities. And I'll point out, we have we have more than just Baba because we also own Naspers, which is our uh, technique to get ownership of Tencent. But there are a number of great opportunities and the technology, the innovation, uh, the quality of the workforce, of course there are risks. And, and I think there are risks investing in every country. There, there should be a, a, a huge amount of people watching this in China who probably think that America has the risk and that's totally fine. So what is the risk in China? There's, of course, there's like political risks. There's this regulatory uncertainty. There's even capital markets concerns, but we watch these very closely and the underlying business models in China rival the business models in the US, especially in these huge tech firms. So you look around at like these $2 trillion valuations in the US prices, and then you go and look in China and you can buy similar companies for three and 400 billion or less, 200 billion uh, at times for Alibaba. These are, these are significant opportunities. I expect they will be volatile. Uh, but yes, I mean, China's been going through some difficult economic times, while the U.S. has been having a pretty robust period in the economy. So do you want to invest uh, where things are trading at very high multiples because the economy is going strong and there's a bit of optimism? It's not terrible to be in the U.S. We're right in the heart of this bull market. Or do you want to allocate to... Uh, a region where there are huge undervaluations and perhaps a little bit un uncertainty, but we're overcompensated for that uncertainty. The risks are, uh, you know, the margin of safety is so large that it really handicaps the risk that we're, we're taking. So I do think over the long term, China is going to be a great place to be invested. And it's nice to do uh, I'm sure we'll get into it, but rather than buying straight through the stock market, uh, the most obvious companies, there are ways to do things where you can get more for your money. For example, we buy Naspers to get Tencent because we get about 150% of the value of Tencent for the same price because it's uh, under a different structure. So there's a lot of opportunities in China. There are some risks. We watch the risks very closely, but I expect that the positions that we own in China will do quite well over the next 5, 10, 15, and more years. Once again, it's long term. It's not about uh, one year or two years, but he, like Matthew is really looking at at least five years and in fact, like more than that, right? So uh, as an investor, it's always a great reminder for us to not just be so formal because of the short term pickup and also don't be too fearful because of this short term uh, downturn, right? But if you look at it long enough, uh, the GDP, uh, can it continue to grow? The population, can it continue to grow? Then... Uh, it gives you pretty good basis of whether the economy can continue to perform or not uh, for certain countries, like for example, China, right? So uh, talking about, finish talking about China, let's look into the US, right? And we also know that uh, recently the Fed has actually started to cut its interest rate. And uh, with this year US election coming, what's your take on the US market? The US market is in a, in a very interesting place. There's obviously all of these external factors and risk factors, but interest rates are a driving force behind the economy. And I think the Fed and Jerome Powell have done a, a superb job. It's quite incredible. I didn't expect them to take a 50 bit uh, percent drop, but that's very beneficial for, for equity. I think it was necessary but uh, but I didn't expect it. And and I expected 25 uh, BIPs. And these are really powerful uh, tools. So as interest rates decline, 
technically speaking, the discount rate that you would use on the future cash flows for the company's earnings would also decline, which means that the intrinsic value goes up. And it's really that simple. I mean, when rates go down, the value of your businesses that are earning money go up. And so uh, this, we are now on a new trend of declining interest rates in the US. We'll see how things, we don't have a crystal ball. I don't anticipate a recession coming in the US uh, imminently. However, we will of course have another recession. Recessions occur regularly. Uh, we'll have bull markets, we'll have bear markets. In fact, every two and a half years, it's really uh, even even more often than two and a half years, we should have a correction. It's really common, you know, a 10% decline in markets. So um, what you want to do is you want to look at the core fundamentals of individual securities. If you're not looking at an index fund or sort of buying a Berkshire Hathaway, which is a conglomerate run by Warren Buffett, uh, you would you would really want to know exactly what's happening under the covers of these businesses. And I'll actually uh, why don't I why don't I point out an interesting aspect because we're talking about things that many uh, even U.S. investors aren't familiar with. So just at dinner the other night, I was listening to another table. Two gentlemen were discussing where they can get five percent on their cash. And I, you know, I don't intervene, but I just eavesdrop. <laughs> and I find their their whole rationale is just twisted. And 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 it's unfortunate because it's how a lot of people think. But you can go and look at like Jeremy Siegel's book, uh, and he just released a, a new edition, uh, Stocks for the Long Run. He has in the first couple, maybe first chapter, this beautiful chart where he's collected hundreds of years of data and he shows what would happen if you invested in stocks or bonds or T-bills or gold or dollars and what happens over years. And then he breaks it into decades and everything else and analyzes this data. It's, I think, the most comprehensive data set that really exists. He's an academic. He's you know, a uh, very important professor at Wharton University. And... What you find is that without question, equities outperform by an enormous amount. And over a 200 year period, it becomes really obvious. It's like, a, you know, if I, if I, these are roughly maybe correct numbers, but if you start with a dollar and you put it in equities, you might have, I think a million dollars or maybe it's 800,000 or so. And if you put it into bonds, you get like a thousand dollars. And if you put it into cash, you get less than a dollar. So these kind of just being aware uh, that entities, you know, the, the structure of the capital markets, these businesses, they're designed to grow capital. They're designed uh, to grow earnings, create profit. That's where you want to invest your money. So to spend a lot of time thinking about where do I get my fifth percent from 4%, it's like, the time allocation is wrong because you're spending time to get 1%. These gentlemen that were discussing it shouldn't, if if they don't need the capital, they shouldn't be worried about this at all. They should actually just be uh, investing in the equity markets where they'll do far, far better than if they just bought a, it put their money in like a 4% bank CD or put it into a high savings rate uh, account. So equities outperform. It's been shown over and over uh, through all this data. That's where you want to put your long-term money. I wouldn't put money into the equity market if you need the capital in the next 12 months or so, because even if you make a great investment, irrational things can happen in the market. And you don't want to need the capital when the market is just pessimistic. And so you really need to have money allocated to long-term growth and you just buy your equities and uh, and you will do very well if you just find great opportunities or ETFs and leave them alone for five or 10 years. 
And speaking about cash allocation, right? Like, like you, you talk about we shouldn't touch emergency fund because we never know what you need to to for your life, right? And that's why that kind of money that you should never invest. But uh, other money, cash that you have that you can invest, it's always advisable to invest for the long run. Uh, but recently, if we observe Warren Buffett, we also realized that he has been raising a lot of cash, like almost 50%. So what is your advice to investors' cash versus uh, invested capital allocation in this scenario? That is a great question because this is a really, uh, it's a very interesting debate and what I think everybody needs to recognize, whether we like it or not, I'm not Warren Buffett and I don't think anybody on this call, is Warren Buffett on this call, Chloe? I don't think Warren Buffett's on this call. So nobody here is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is playing a very different game. And Warren Buffett's game is that he has a trillion dollar entity and he's allocating hundreds of billions of dollars on a regular basis. And he has a fiduciary responsibility for these massive shareholders. And is this, this is, uh, you know, we're in like the sixth decade of their uh, involvement of, of Warren Buffett's involvement and in the recently passed Charlie Munger. These individuals are trying to shore up capital because they have insurance claims. They're trying to, and, and I want to make a emphasize something. Warren Buffett cannot move the needle with any sort of million dollar investments. So he needs to wait for the pessimism to be so great that he can allocate tens and hundreds of billions. And so uh, Warren Buffett's not a market timer, but he understands opportunity cost of capital. Mm -hmm. Opportunity cost of capital is such an important and key concept. It's like opportunity cost of time. If you're spending your time here on this call, you're not spending your time doing something else. And so you try to maximize uh, the use of your time. Well, you also try to maximize the use of your capital. And Warren Buffett doesn't know what opportunities are going to be available tomorrow, but he senses that at his level where he's allocating to mega caps that are worth trillions, there will probably be some great opportunities further in the future versus today. So although he's not a market timer, he looks at opportunity costs. He says the expect return in Bank of America is lower than what might transpire over the next five, six, seven years. And also he does get a very reasonable treasury bill rate yeah. at this point. But it is a very different game because most likely nobody on this call is looking to allocate billions. And by the way, one or two billion would be manageable. But when you're allocating millions or hundreds of thousands, there are a lot of opportunities. Warren Buffett simply can't take advantage of those opportunities. So it actually gives everyone on this call an advantage above Warren Buffett. He simply cannot look at a $5 billion market cap comp company credibly. If he were to put a billion in, the company's management team would react, things would change. Uh, so it's very hard for him to be looking at the 5,000 plus market in the US or even globally. He's really focused on the top 10 or 20 positions. And if they're not cheap, he's not gonna buy them. And so inevitably he ends up with this huge pile of cash and what happens is the public mistakenly thinks that they themselves should be holding on to all this cash, but they have a different opportunity set than Warren Buffett. And so I think it's very compelling to buy Berkshire Hathaway because without making any changes, you can simply see that Warren Buffett is making the changes for you. I believe his salary is still 100,000 a year. Yeah. So you have Warren Buffett, the greatest investor of all time, managing your assets for $100,000. And that's his total income for everyone's assets that he's managing. So this is a really nice opportunity. He's going to go into cash for you. But that's because Warren Buffett doesn't have the opportunities. Berkshire Hathaway doesn't have the same super set of opportunities. So you can go out and you can find these very small uh, micro cap 
or undervalued secure underfollowed securities, and you can have an advantage over what Warren Buffett's looking at. So I don't think that a small portfolio needs to have a huge amount of cash. We have no cash. We're fully invested. Uh, you know, we're doing really, we just, we just had a 17% quarter. Um, we're fully invested. So I don't think there's a need to, if you can't find opportunities in the U S go look in Turkey. If you can't find opportunities in Turkey, go look in China. There are opportunities all over the world. Go look in Japan. You will find, if you can't find 10 opportunities, send the capital to us because we have way more opportunities than capital. Exactly. And I also know that for your fund, you also use certain option strategy to actually um, utilize the cash in a in a very innov innovative way, right? So can you share with us exactly how do you use options to increase the return for your partners? Yeah, let's start at the beginning with this, because what happens is where there's mystery, there's margin. So there's a lot of times Look, in every in most financial careers, people start to specialize. They start to specialize at an early age after university. It's like they're going to focus on equity analysis or they're going to become a trader or they're going to focus on the options market. And even at Goldman Sachs, these desks, the trading desks are often on different floors in different buildings. There's not a lot of interaction. And so we have found many times it's like a repeated theme is that at these intersections, there becomes this opportunity because there's there's less conviction, there's less people that can understand both scenarios. And so what I recognized about more than 20 years ago now, uh, and it's really simple in my mind, but for people who have studied it academically in a different way, this is an inversion of the typical way that it's looked at, we simply use options as a tool to buy the equity, but there's systemic issues within the options market. And I'm not a big fan of money going out. And so the, but the first level thinking for options is, oh, the stock's going to go up. So I'm going to buy a call. All right. And that's, uh, that's a really elementary approach. Uh, what we do is we say, well, the stock's going up. The stock, it's not the stock is going up. The value is significantly higher than the price. This is a great company, outstanding business model, great management team, and the price is low. Surprisingly, in value investing communities, it's very common. We're, we're usually early. We see something, we don't understand what, how this could persist. And there's not a lot of opportunities, but we tend to gravitate toward similar opportunities. We share ideas with each other. Look at this situation. And then that persists for a year or so. And the market just doesn't recognize it. And then maybe in the future things happen and then the stock goes up considerably. So during that period, what we do is we sell and we write cash secured puts. So we're writing these as a tool to own the stock. Instead of buying a call and putting money out and then hoping and speculating that the stock will rise, we are writing a put, selling that put, which commits us to buying the stock if it goes lower. And people pay us a premium up front to sell that put. So if I were to break down, this is a really uh, valuable concept. So if I were to break down this very simply, it would just say, look, there's a hundred dollars stock. Let's say we value it at a thousand dollars. And I don't, I don't mean to use dollars all the time. This could be any currency, a hundred versus a thousand in value. And what we would do is we would say, okay, we'd love to own these shares for a hundred dollars. So maybe we would sell a hundred dollars strike and it would go out Maybe, you know, we're in October of, of 24. We can find contracts that go to January of 26 very easily, just over a year. Mm. And we might say, okay, we'll commit to buying for $100 these shares. And then we request a price. We get to state the price that we would require and we require maybe $20. Now, will anybody buy that contract from us? That's the question. 
And because of volatility in the marketplace, because these contracts are often used for very different purposes, we're using this for a very unique purpose. There are not many people doing this. It's very powerful. Uh, like again, where there's mystery, there's margin. So we write a contract. We commit to buying for a hundred over the next year plus, And somebody pays us $20 for that. And then we just hold on to the $20. So we, we take in the $20. We keep 80 of our own collateral so that we have a hundred dollars to buy the security. If the counterpart puts the security to our portfolio and we want to buy it. And what that does is it puts our net cost to ownership from 100 down to 80. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've been paid $20 up front. And the way that it happens mechanically, and I really encourage you to all try this in your portfolio. It's, it's very simple. And when you do it once, you'll see how it works. You don't have to do it. You don't have to make it one of your huge portfolio positions, sell or write one put. It requires a number of steps to get to that point. And those that do it are handsomely rewarded. So you write one put, you receive $20 in your brokerage account. You'll have an offsetting liability, which is your short put. So you'll bring in $20 in cash And your value doesn't go up in your portfolio. You have $20 in assets and you have a 20 liability. Okay. That's what happens day one. Now the cash stays stable and the price of the option starts to fluctuate. And if you've done your homework well and the price moves or stays somewhere above 100, it will asymptotically, that liability, that short position will asymptotically approach zero. You'll have volatility decay, time decay, and ultimately intrinsic value of that option is zero. And so in that year plus, you can earn $20 on your ADN collateral without even owning the stock on a super undervalued company. And you do that in just over a year and you and you never even have to own the stock. So that 20 on 80 is a 25% return. It's an enormous return. Mm-hmm. And then if the shares decline, which you know, in in based on the analysis done would be irrational, But if the shares decline and go to 90 or even 80, you then get to buy these shares. And you're very pleased to buy them. If you'd bought them at 100, like a normal equity uh, purchaser, you would be down. But because you sold the put, put you're actually up or flat. And now you're accumulating shares at 80. So this gives you an opportunity to buy stock for less than it actually costs in the stock market. And there's very few people that do it. It's not very difficult. It's just getting over the mental hurdle of understanding that there's a better way to buy the equity. You can get paid to buy somebody's equity. And uh, and it's and it's really rewarding because as those shares then grow to a thousand, you instead of paying 100 and you would make like 900 percent, you're now buying for 80. So you're up making like 12, 13 X. And for those who understand this, when it gets to a thousand, you wouldn't just sell the stock when it's like overvalued or something, you would write a covered call. Mm -hmm. And again, you would get paid. And so instead of selling at a thousand, you might say, oh, we'll sell it at a thousand if you pay us a hundred. And so we are going to enter in for 80 and and exit for 1,100 where everybody else is entering for a thousand or for a hundred and leaving for a thousand. So this, if you did this over a 10 year period, you would find that your expected returns on an annualized basis are many percentage points higher than just somebody who's buying stock with a market or limit order, the old fashioned way. And by the way, I never buy stock the old fashioned way. There's no way personally for my children. I I just, it seems so irrational for me. I would never buy Baba right now for whatever price. If I wanted to buy Baba, uh, I would 100% be selling puts and I, and we are selling puts. So uh, that is a much better approach to, if you're a value investor and you're a long-term thinker uh, that lowers your entry price that increases your expected return. And it seems totally irrational to me to pay more. Uh, Even if you want it now, it's, I think, Thursday (laughs) for all of us. I don't know what day it is, sorry. Uh, And 
on Friday, contracts will expire. Sell a put that expires tomorrow. Yeah. You know, your price is lower than anybody else buying it in the market. So it's a yeah. very, very attractive opportunity. How many of you can see the power of options to what Matthew has elaborated? If you can see it, can you type O in the chat, right? O stands for options. It's very, very powerful. This is what I have been also sharing with you guys openly as well. Uh, learn to use options to increase your return because it's proven to work. And right now you can also see it from a $25 million fund manager that he himself also uses it. So you just want to make sure you really get the concept right, the, the right uh, thinking model, why you do options in a very, very safe way and how you can do it, right? Yeah, exactly, right? So uh, right now, okay, uh, wow, it's almost an hour. Is it okay that we just... Uh, we, we get you to answer a few more questions. I know that it's a very precious. I'm, I'm happy to be here with your, your audience, Chloe. I think you have a great following. So let's just continue on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's answer some of the questions from our followers here as well. Uh, I think John, he's asking like, how do you balance the margin of safety with potential growth when analyzing undervalued stocks? Because he himself tend to prioritize, prioritize downside protection, but he would like to have your thoughts on how to strike a balance between mitigating risk and capturing long-term growth. This is a great question. And it's interesting because in many ways, they're cultural nuances, which is somewhat, I've just observed it through conferences around the world and uh, various global activity. I think Americans are very adept at calculating risk and taking risk because in the US, uh, let's not say this from a financial perspective, but from an entrepreneurial respect perspective, uh, I think it's encouraged to go out and take a risk, try something new. And if you fail, it's not a problem. You can just go and try something new again. And this is deeply embedded in the psyche of the American culture. So uh, when I think about this question you're asking, if you're doing your homework right, of course, we are always focused on the downside. I mean, it is it is the most important. Warren Buffett says rule number one is never lose money. And the reason is, is when you lose money, now you have to, now you have to get it back. You have to earn more. Mm -hmm. So the margin of safety concept is very real and it's very highly important. If you use these puts, you're embedding a natural margin of safety, by the way. So you're already calculating something undervalued. And then on top of that, you're able to say, okay, I'll sell a put. And sometimes people have a watch list. They they think, okay, uh, this company's selling for 75 and I'm going to buy it if it gets to 70. Well, you can sell a put at 70, get paid while you wait for it to go to 70. And if it doesn't go there, uh, you can still make a nice premium, make an IRR rather than just sitting on cash doing nothing. Uh, if you have the conviction in the firm, you need to get over the psychological hurdle and just make the investment. And I think you need to make an investment. It helps me to make an investment and consider myself a true owner of that business. And because of the long-term mentality that we have, one of the positions we hold, for example, is a company called Daily Journal. It's a small company that was uh, built and run by Charlie Munger and some of him and Warren Buffett's friends over many decades. Uh, when you look at a firm like this, the, the potential is great, but it's a little bit uncertain. You need to get over the hurdle rate. And we have bought about half a percent of that business. I don't think that we will sell that business. Uh, I have that business in my children's portfolio. I hope that they have that for their entire lives. And so if you have that sort of mentality, I don't think you need to worry as much as long as the company is a sound business with a great management team, they're going to navigate the future for you. It's sort of like having Warren Buffett change the allocation of their portfolio on your behalf. 
You don't have to do anything. Warren Buffett's going to sell Bank of America. He's going to buy Chubb Insurance. He's going to change the portfolio for you. He's going to be managing the Occidental position without you having to do anything externally. So when you find the, there's just not enough opportunities out there. So if you are truly looking and you find something, this is a gem. You should, if you have the conviction, you can allocate a lot to this position. So again, it's a little bit cultural. I think if you have proper optimized diversification, you can deal with a little bit of the volatility, but there are, there are definitely opportunities out there. When you find something that you know well, that seems peculiar, that becomes very interesting because again, where there's mystery, there's margin. A low, undervalued and underfollowed security could be a real opportunity for your portfolio. So how do you get that conviction? Well, you simply understand very deeply that the intrinsic value is substantially higher. And I found one thing that's really important. You want time to be in your favor. So you don't want to be buying a melting ice cube. And maybe some of you saw that we had a position in this U.S. mall company, Seritage, and then we reversed that position. And that was a big change for us. But the reason is that that position that had compounded had compounding potential transitioned into a melting ice cube and we don't want to be in a position where if we have to hold for 10 years we might be holding something that's worth less so if you buy something that's growing and undervalued and it's run by a great management team you're probably going to be in a really great position and then it becomes just an opportunity cost question is there a better opportunity than the one that you're looking at and if you can't find it and you make that allocation, you can continue to watch in that position, but ultimately you want to leave that, let that bake, let that sit there for maybe a very long time, maybe decades. And I think you'll find that will work very well for you. So you need a margin of safety. When you find the opportunities, there's just not a lot of them. In fact, one of the hardest things is just back up the truck when you find the opportunity. When you really find the opportunity, some of you that are in, China, in Asia, you see the opportunities. They're they're in front of you. You're you're looking there and you're saying, here's Starbucks selling for this, and here's Luck and Coffee selling for this. Okay, it seems very obvious. When it seems obvious to you, if you've done your homework, you really can be right. You can know more than portfolio managers in the in the West. You can know more than portfolio managers are looking at different things. You can know more about a specific company than Warren Buffett. So when you have that level of conviction, you just back up the truck and you will do, I think, very well. If your data's right and your research right, you need to have that conviction. And, and if you don't, you should just buy an index fund. And that's totally okay. There's doctors and lawyers. We have, we have really sophisticated people inside of our fund. And sometimes it's hard for somebody who's been an engineer, who's gotten straight A's their whole life. They've been playing concert, their concert uh, pianist and doing everything else in the world right. And they look at the financial world and they think, well, this is something really simple. And frankly, it is quite simple if you get the concepts right. But there are so many ancillary, uh, almost psychological challenges. You know, a yeah. heart surgeon isn't necessarily going to be great at selecting stocks. So yeah. it's okay to specialize in your heart surgeries and allocate to an ETF or find a great portfolio manager to run it for you. But when you find that conviction, go in there and buy it with 10 or 20% of your whole net worth. That's what you need to do. You'll find that you, or sell a put with a notional exposure of 10 or 20% of your whole net worth. Yeah, I, I think I absolutely agree because at the end of the day, um, it's really also about understanding ourselves. Like, do we have that passion? Do we have the cut? to really become very good at individual stock pickings, right? If we don't have, then it's okay to delegate this role to someone else, right? It can be 
to Warren Buffett, it can be to Matthew, it can be just to an ETF, right? That that itself, it's also good enough, right? Because at the end of the day, you just want to make sure you can create wealth in a sustainable way. And in order to do that, you first have to understand your own character first. I, I think that's very, very true. And the next question, yeah, you, you want to add down any, anything, Matthew? No, well, I'm so glad you brought that up because it's so relevant. In fact, we, we just sent out the, I, I don't know if it's distributed yet, if the if the distribution has gone out, but we, we've prepared and we're sending out the uh, Q3 quarterly letter, which is, by the way, available on our website. Uh, we, we set it out via email, but you can just go to petersonfonts.com and look at it. And in the the very front line of that, I've, I'm, I'm really pleased. I've, I've built a little relationship with Arnold Vandenberg, who I have a great respect for. And uh, he's a he's a legendary investor and he's had a legendary life. He runs Century Management here in Austin, where I live now. I used to live in L.A. and now I'm in Austin. Uh, and I just put a quote right at the top of the letter. And I'm just going to read it to you. Investing isn't about beating others at the game. It's about controlling yourself at your own game. And I think that's exactly what you're saying. And it's totally correct. You need to find investments that work for you. It's very hard. Guy Spear talks about this. Guy Spear is not Warren Buffett. He's not going to invest like Warren Buffett. He needs to invest like Guy Spear. And oftentimes, your own portfolio is like a projection almost of your own internal beliefs and convictions. And it's a very interesting aspect. But if we were to go and try to invest exactly like Warren Buffett, we would fail. We have to invest like Matthew Peterson, Chloe. You need to invest like the Arigato investor. And that is what will give you the conviction to maintain your portfolio in times of turmoil. You will understand your holdings. You don't need to understand all of Buffett's holdings. You need to understand your own holdings. And it's a very personal game. It's about controlling your own psychology, your own emotions. It's about not making mistakes. A lot of times, some of you have probably read these articles about the loser game, intense. OK, you don't want to be if you're an amateur tennis player, you're not going to be scoring aces on your opponent. You just want to play in the middle field and let your opponent make some mistakes. So you need to play for your own portfolio. You need to play with your own. Uh, so I can't tell you not to hold 10 percent in cash because that may that 10 percent in cash may allow you to keep the 90 percent invested. So if that's what you need to maintain a long-term mindset, then put it in your checklist and stick to it. So you need to learn about yourself to make the portfolio match what how you live your life. Yeah. At the end of the day, there's no one size fit all uh, strategy. It's about being aware, understanding yourself, and really finding that strategy that most suitable for yourself. And everybody is different. I absolutely love that. And the next question from James, I think this is a great question, although it's critical, but I think uh, Matthew, you are, you are definitely very comfortable dealing with critical questions. And he's asking, why do you think most funds underperform the market, despite the fact that, you know, most funds, they already like do so much analysis, they already put so much effort, so much study. Why do they still underperform? A great question. There are so many reasons, but let me start with just a few. First of all, most funds are over diversified. So they set themselves up from the beginning and it becomes impossible. Quite literally, they've positioned themselves to never be able to achieve their objective. So uh, the starting point is flawed for many funds. Many funds aren't focused on outperforming the market. In fact, if you have this concept that is, we're going to beat the S&P, I think a lot of it comes from Warren Buffett and the value investing community because we, rep we recognize there's an opportunity cost. You've taken your money out of the S&P, essentially, and put it into your own individual conviction that you think will outperform. Why do fund managers outperform? Too much turnover, too many expenses, over diversification. All right, these are three very fundamental reasons. Uh, surprisingly, 
what happens in the S&P. The S&P is very powerful because there's a lot less emotion and you can get some great returns out of companies that you maybe wouldn't buy. Mm. And they're just embedded inside of the S&P. Uh, let me, let me tell you this back to Jeremy Siegel's book stocks for the long run, at least right now in the United States, uh, we've been experiencing this bull market and for over 200 years, the S and P has returned 6.8 now 6.9, which is amazing. We get, we, I mean, we're like, we've moved up in our 200 year average recently. 6.9% annualized plus inflation for centuries. Uh, over the last 15 years, since the financial crisis, the S&P has returned about 15% annualized. So what this means, not this in particular, but this is, it's unsustainable. If, if the market were continued to grow at 15% annualized, it would be like the wealth is larger than planet Earth in a another few decades. So what will happen, because it's unsustainable, is we'll have a more flat and volatile future in the S&P. So actually, while many funds, in fact, I would say the majority of even great funds, have underperformed over the last 15 years, as long as they're doing something stable and they're thinking long-term and their returns are uh, reasonably higher than the long run average of the S&P, I would expect that many of those funds will outperform over the next decade because we'll have a period where the S&P can't perform as well. Uh, maybe there will be funds that move and probably there will be funds that move from S&P type investments to international investments, Asia, even Europe, Africa, all over the world. So as that happens, we'll have a little more volatility. We'll have a little bit of a lower growth in the S&P. And I think the future of some funds will outperform, but it's a, many funds are not trying to outperform. So if you have a speculative fund, you know, Kathy Wood, ARK Investments, you know, she wants to outperform, but actually she's just looking for innovative technologies. She's going to stick to her mandate. And as long as she's invested in Tesla and AI and all these other things, she's following her mandate whether they outperform or underperform, there's probably going to be billions in her fund. So uh, there's a lot of different approaches. So you want the fund managers that are trying to outperform, that have a skill set that leads them to outperform, but uh, they're not going to outperform in every year. Uh, it's very, very difficult to just have an all-weather portfolio that actually outperforms. So Ray Dalio at Bridgewater has an all-weather portfolio. I would expect that all-weather portfolio is certainly going to underperform. But maybe it will do okay during a crisis. So you're willing to take an underperformance and you're just looking for protection. So there's different mindsets. There's different products available, uh, but it is... Generally, it comes down to expenses. It comes down to turnover. It comes down to excess diversification. And these things just make it fundamentally uh, challenging to beat the market. And that's and that's why most fund managers underperform. And at the same time, just like what Matthew said, right? A lot of funds, they, are, uh, they also need to please the investors. They can't, uh, most investors cannot, cannot bear with volatility. And because of that, those fund managers in the first place, they know that they cannot be too aggressive. They cannot be too concentrated for some reason. And because of that, they cannot outperform. So, so that's Chloe, why- it's very interesting. I don't mean to interrupt you at all, but I just sure. want to point out, most fund managers don't run the portfolio like they would run their own assets. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting concept because they're trying to appease the- investor base and so they're making decisions based on like short-term psychology and how it's going to affect their business rather than just growing for the long term so 
Seth Klarman talks about how important it is to have a super high quality investor base. And you can see Warren Buffett is one of the people that uh, really cares about his shareholders. That's very different. Most firms don't spend that much time worrying about who owns the stock. But that is a very important concept. Those people are defending your business. They're protecting your business. And so a fund manager who's always worried about uh, how their investors are going to feel psychologically in the short term are setting themselves up to underperform. Exactly. And that's why when you choose fund managers, you really want to make sure that person, you align with the values. And that person is also, I think, um, being very, very persistent in preserving what is the true principle of the fund rather than being uh, swayed by all those emotions that faced by uh, individual investors of the fund. And that's right. So, so all of these all of these followers and anybody that's viewing this online, that's, that is so fundamentally correct. And from a fund manager's perspective, it's the same thing when we're having our meetings with potential LPs, I am truly evaluating whether this LP has the right mentality. So can you imagine, uh, of course, people come into it with the concept they want to grow money, that blah, 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 blah. But it's like saying you want to go out to dinner. If if we are prepared to serve a three Michelin star meal and somebody wants to come in really quickly and have McDonald's, we don't sell McDonald's. So they are going to be unhappy no matter what happens. So we have to make sure that we don't have LPs that become worried, you know, in the last six years, I think we're up net 20%, uh, over 20% in five out of the six years. And in the sixth year, we were down 18%. So can you imagine if we had an LP base that during that dip, uh, which doesn't affect me other than the fact that it affects the psychology of the wrong LP base. It, can you imagine if they all started selling and leaving that would be the totally wrong. What they do instead is they add. So just as your followers evaluate fund managers, mm -hmm. they want to make sure they're they're selling what they're looking for. So if you need an all-weather portfolio, go to Ray Dahlia. If you want a uh, Turkish-focused fund, you can go to Masut Eliotolu. If you want to have a global fund, with some strategic alternative, you can come and talk to us. So there are different offerings and they are really our products. And you wanna make sure that what your views are resonate with the manager's views. And part of that is aligning interests. Like all my capital in the fund means I'm not managing my own portfolio outside of the fund. There's nothing going on that's different. Like we're, we're very aligned with the decisions I make from a tax perspective or an allocation perspective, they impact all of the investors. So I am an investor in my own fund. And uh, and so that sort of helps us to hopefully manage the capital like I would truly manage my own capital because I am truly managing my own capital. And so just like your, invest, your followers here uh, want to be evaluating the managers, we also evaluate, are we served? Because not everybody understands. Uh, you know, is someone looking for a, a fast food or is somebody looking for something that's going to be really gourmet? Because we we only serve the gourmet. So if you want the fast food, we I can tell you somewhere else to go. I'm happy to help you, but it won't be by owning our fund. If that uh, and that and that's a really essential piece to this puzzle. And that's why I think the word partner it comes. It takes two hands to clap, right? That it's like. Yeah, it has to be suitable, right? It can't be like I want this, but then the fund cannot provide, or the fund has certain philosophy, but the the investors totally cannot accept, right? So it's it's a partnership. Seth Klarman thinks that your investor base is one of the key components of a successful firm because if you have a volatility period of volatility in your value fund, and that's when you want to buy. Imagine if you had held cash, say you'd held ten percent cash for the opportunity to buy and just 10% of your LPs were not aligned. Those 10% leave and they take all of your cash away. 
They take away the ammunition that you saved up for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So what you really need are the LPs, the partners that say, wow, we're down, time to add money. Mm -hmm. And if you can align your investors with your own fund principles, then you get that sort of yin yang going in the right direction. We want people to celebrate and achieve their goals when we're at highs and when we're at lows, we want them to throw capital in so we can make these great uh, allocations with the capital and great future investments. That's beautiful. And I think I'm almost coming into the second last question. Uh, this question has nothing to do with investing, but more like uh, trying to understand from your point of view, your personal experience. Imagine today, okay, Matthew, you have lived as long as you wanted and you have accomplished every single thing that you want to accomplish in life. And whatever videos that you have produced out so far, whatever work that you have produced out so far, you cannot, you have to take it all away, right? Nobody can ever assess to all your wisdoms after you're gone. So if today's the last day, what would be the advice that you will want to give? to your children, right? Then what would you want them to start doing? This is a deep question. So I, I'm i gone today and nothing I've, <laughs> I've done so far has any impact. Look, um, it's, it's actually simple at the high level. It's like hard work, energy, integrity, these things are super valuable concepts. Uh, Long-term thinking. In fact, um, Peter Kaufman, I have a lot of respect for Peter Kaufman. I've uh, had a number of conversations with him over the years and he writes these. Uh, he's actually the producer of, or the author of Poor Charlie's Almanac. Oh. But he also writes these very insightful uh, packets that aren't readily available, but you can find a few of them online. One thing that he was explained to me a few years ago that's pretty powerful is that you can live your life twice if you're always solving difficult questions from the perspective of a of your 95 year old self. And in fact, he says 93 for some reason. And so, from your 93 year old self. If you evaluate what would my 93 year old self do in this situation, you tend to make a better long term decision and and then you get to see how it plays out. So so Kaufman really feels you get to live your life twice. He you always take the perspective of your your old, old self and you make the decision, you know, are you going to marry this person or this person? Well, think about it from your perspective when you're 95. There, you may have a different reason to make that sort of selection. So by really trying to uh, evaluate from a long-term perspective, uh, it will help you. But ultimately, integrity, hard work, having a lot of energy, these are really important concepts and a long-term mindset. I think these these. And, you know, <laughs> these will put you in the right direction. Uh, and then it's very important that when you get knocked down, you stand back up because you'll get knocked down a ton of times in life. So, uh, in fact, I think it's pretty much inevitable. Like, you know, a life is sort of like a, a in some ways, normal distribution. You're going to have events in your life. Mm -hmm. People are going to hurt you. People are going to pass away. You're going to have hardships. And if you keep getting back up, you're stronger than most people. And if you have the energy and the integrity and the work ethic to keep going, and you're thinking about how to make your decisions from the perspective of a wise old individual, uh, I think you'll be on the right track and you'll be, you'll have advantages uh, compared to others. Many people are not taking this perspective. So uh, I would I would highly recommend a strong work ethic, a lot of energy, definitely integrity, long-term decisions from your old wise self. And, and then you get to live your life twice. That's beautiful. And I just love how you 
describe all those important things that you want your children to do. And it has nothing to do with money, right? It, it has nothing to do with uh, how much money that, that they must make and all this, but it's about how to live their best life, right? How to live a fulfilling life that they, they will respect themselves and people will respect them because they have high integrity, they have great work habit, they work hard to accomplish things. And I absolutely love that. How many of you learned a lot from Matthew so far? If you learn a lot, can you type down what is the greatest learning that I've taken away from the past? In fact, one and a half hour. Thank you so much, Matthew, for being so gracious with your time. So while we wait- I'm talking too long, Chloe. I'm going on and on and on. <laughs> your questions are wonderful. Thank you. And where can people find out more about your work, your fun, if they're interested in, how can they get in touch with you and your team? Yeah, great. So we're on Twitter. We have a great YouTube channel. Chloe's all over our YouTube channel as well. Uh, our website is petersonfunds.com. All right. And on petersonfunds.com, we write quarterly letters. So there's quite a bit of following. I think we have, you know, 50 letters uh, going back over a decade. And the annual letters are really uh, thorough. So right there in letters... I'll even tell you all on this call, you don't need to all sign up, but if you'd like, the password is Buffett with a lowercase b and two t's, which is how you would spell Buffett because it's not a buffet. <laughs> Let's see if it works for Chloe. And, and look, there we go. And look, you have the Q3 letter. You're the first one to access it. I don't think anybody has that letter. That's just posted on our website. Wow. Uh, but the real letters are the annual letters. So if you go back to the previous page and you were to look at, go down one row further, and you can look at this 2023 annual that was just posted a couple months ago right there. And this is our full letter. We cover so many different aspects. Uh, we work very hard on this letter and we produce these each year. So, uh, you know, through our YouTube channel, we're on a lot of different podcasts and um, and we're on Twitter. So I think people can really find us. And if they ever want to talk further, if they want to talk about joining the fund or investing, certainly reach out and um, you can send me an email. You can also include andrew.park at petersonfunds.com. My email is matthew.peterson at petersonfunds.com. I just have so many emails uh, that it's helpful if you include Andrew. And uh, we're happy to talk further with with you know, accredited investors who are really interested in what we're doing, where um, we have about 23 spots remaining in our fund. There's regulatory uh, requirements. So nine, funds have 99 spots and we're in the high 70s. So we will fill our spots and we'll have a waiting list just like everyone else. Uh, but right now we are still out there raising capital. So if anybody's interested, just reach out to us. Thank you so, so much. And I absolutely also love all the audience takeaway as well. Mus Maslan said that he, uh, greatest takeaway from this is that no, there's no one size fit off approach to investing and your investment should reflect your personality and what works best for you. Absolutely love that. And Odi said that don't over diversify. Uh, she learned a lot today. So many people say it's super insightful. And Mui Mui said that buy ETF and Berkshire Hathaway and go holiday. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. That's <laughs> right. And I, I just love this quote by Arnold Vandenberg. It encompasses what was just said. It's investing isn't about beating others at the game. It's about controlling yourself at your own game. And it just encompasses so much in that statement. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Matthew, for spending your precious morning with us. Uh, just like you could have spent this precious time to do other things, but you chose to be here with us to share your wisdom. And we are internally grateful for that. How many of you are thankful to Matthew's generous sharing? If you are, can you type Arigato in the chat, right? We are Arigato investors <laughs> and we are super grateful to yeah. Matthew, for being here. Arigato, arigato, fantastic. Chloe, thank you all very much. I hope this does wonders for your portfolio and your life. Money doesn't make you happy, but it will give you a lot of freedom. So uh, I hope that I hope that this works out very well for all of you. Let me know if you have any questions. And I hope to see many of you 
at the Omaha Press Club next year in Omaha. Thank you.